our midst. And this is Vision Weekend. It's a very special time for our house as a family. There's a resistance to do the will of the Father in the life of humanity, just in our human nature. We want to do what we want to do. But we're no longer to be living our lives from that standpoint. in our flesh but we're really just needing to continue to yield ourselves to the spirit of God who lives in us and as holding our granddaughter Nicole's baby and Branson's baby just crying out to God we could have gone further we could have gone longer we're just endeavoring to be sensitive to your time and yet at the same time, there's just, there's a, you know, I mean, I just could have just broken down in tears. Because there are people that should be here that aren't here, and there are people that are going to be coming in and coming back. And my heart, I just say, Father, crying out to him and I said Lord God where there's a lack of understanding for the family of this house I'm not responsible for other families for other church families but I was crying out for our family word of life and that where there's a lack of understanding or there's a resistance there's a breaking down of understanding our individual significance for what God wants to do. My heart was just breaking for that lack of understanding and allowing the enemy to come in and divide and remove us from our called positions. And so I just had to come up and share with us, family. This is a weekend that we've been endeavoring to prepare for God to speak to us. And there's just been spiritual warfare against what God's wanting to do because the devil is so threatened by each and every one of us here today. He doesn't want our eyes to be opened. He doesn't want our hearts to be receptive. It is the simplicity of choice. It's a choice. There will be a supernatural ability that we will have from God that we didn't think was possible. But God's just needing our willingness. He can't make us willing. He's given us a will. It's our choice to be willing. But I tell you, where God wants to take us as a church family is beyond what we've ever imagined. It's, it's, it's a bigger plan that God has. And each and every one of our lives and our marriages and our children and the people that God's called us to, to have influence or be a part of everything that's connected with us will benefit for the God plan that we allow God to do in our lives and through our lives. Let's be the change. But it starts with us. Just lift your hands up towards heaven. Pastor Fika is going to be sharing a word in season for us. But I know that the Spirit of God is hovering over us. And for those that needed to be here and those that are coming in and coming back, Father God, we lift up our brothers and sisters, the family of Word of Life. And Father, we thank you for those that are watching us online, that there's no time or distance in the realm of the Spirit. God, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Father. Let the abundance of your grace 
embrace us, Lord God, today. Because in your grace, Father, there is sufficiency. There is a supernatural. Father God, for marriages to be strengthened, for relationships with our children to be stronger, Father God, for the plans and purposes that you've impressed upon our hearts for your kingdom's sake, God, to, to be made possible by the work of your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for an open heaven that's upon us, that, that's open to us right now, that's embracing us, your love that never fails. God, do that work in our hearts right now. There he is. Just let him have his way in your heart. What's he been saying to us from last night to today to right now? Many of us, if not all of us, came forward wanting to be who God needs us to be for our generation. And that includes our families and the people on the job and just everyone around us. God loves this city. God loves this state. God loves our nation. God loves the world. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Bring us healing with your warm embrace. Show your power, make your presence known. Holy Spirit, come fill this place. Breath of God, we need a touch from you. Shine down on us with the light of with your hands lifted up towards heaven where our help comes from. Hallelujah. Father, we acknowledge your presence, Lord. We thank you for your peace in this place. Thank you, Lord God, Father, for your joy. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that is sufficient, your ability, God, upon us, enabling us, Lord, to do what we cannot do on our own. We acknowledge your Holy Spirit here in this place, the leader, the teacher of the church. Come on, let the Holy Spirit just saturate our hearts. He infuses us with inner might. He infuses us with inner strength. 
Rivers of living water flow, flow, flow. There it is, praying the Holy Ghost. Breba candele ba sa ta che de ba, ore ba sa te ke te de be, dora ba san de de ba de 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 be se. Oh, we praise Him, praise Him. Oh, we magnify. You are Lord, you are King, King over all, King over everything, God. Everything under Your Lordship, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Lord and King, who was, who is, and is to come. We bless Your name. We magnify your name. We lift up your name. Your name is above sickness. Your name is above disease. Your name is above fear. Your name is above shame. Your name is above intimidation. Your name is above insecurity, inferiority. The name of Jesus is greater. The name of Jesus is more powerful. The name of Jesus is mighty. The name of Jesus is holy. The name of Jesus is righteous. Come on, declare that name. Ore ba tan de sete kata, from te te de me. Ore ba, let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. Let the river flow, let the river flow. Bre ba da san de ke te de 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 ba, bre ba san da de. Father God, Lord, we're thanking you here this morning and afternoon, this whole weekend. If I change, everything changes. God, there is a beckoning by your spirit to go to the other side because the miracle is on the other side of our obedience. And Lord, there might be giants in the valley of Elah. Lord, there might be a storm, Lord God, Father, between us and the madman of Gadarene. But Lord God, nevertheless, Father, you are on our boat. Nevertheless, God, Father, you are with us. And Lord God, Father, the enemy's defeat has already been regulated 2,000 years ago. Ha ha, come on. The enemy's already defeated on the cross 2,000 years ago. The, the giant has been removed. The storm has been calmed down. And Father God, Lord, we're thanking you that being the change God means apprehending every promise you have for us. Being the change means we will not let the enemy rob us, God, of what you died to give us on the cross of Calvary, on that blood-stained cross. So, Lord God, Father, we don't have to beg you to do what you've already done, Lord. We just need to receive the victory. We just need to receive the power. We need to just walk it out. We just need to open our eyes. We just need to pulsate and embrace it, embrace it. Embrace the love of God. Embrace the peace of God. Embrace the righteousness of God. It's not of your works. We cannot work, work, work. Rest in the Lord, my son. Rest in the Lord, my son. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Find rest in the presence of the Almighty God. High five your neighbor. You may be seated. Y'all better listen real fast. Hallelujah. Let's give it up for all of our speakers and everybody that's already been. For the sake of time here, we're going to zigzag into some things here. But about a couple of months ago, I was given an altar call at the uh, Award of Life Kona. And as I was pacing up and down the stage, I was giving the altar call. And what I said was, some of you in this place need to get saved. That was what I said. And I heard somewhere said, saved from what? <laughs> and it was coming from this way. I thought it was a worship team. I looked back. No one was behind me. The whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. And the devil was trying to question me. Any of you here need to get saved? He says, saved from what? And I heard in my spirit, secular humanism, secular humanistic thinking are saying that, you know what? You believe in your God? Good. You keep it? We, I'm fine. I'm not hurting nobody. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm, 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 I, give, I give to the poor. So the question that becomes is, why are you saved? Why, why are we, you don't have to answer me. 
But think about it because I had to answer that question right there on that spot. And for the next five minutes as I was ministering, I had to answer that question. Because why do you get saved? Is it heaven? That's why you're saved. That's great. But if that's the case, then come up here. Let's, uh, let's send you there now. <laughs> if that's the goal, that's the ultimate, right? Is it, oh, uh, I'm saved because it made me a better father. It made me a better person. And so the, the question that becomes, oh, so is it a behavior modification? Is that what it has come down to? You're looking for good behavior. Oh, maybe a better father. So it's behavior modification. Is that what Christianity have come down to? Why are you saved? See, because when you ask people that, he says, saved from what? I'm good, pastor. I don't hurt nobody. I, 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 I don't cuss. I don't, I don't drink. I'll do nothing. And I had to take them back to origin. Because sometimes when we preach a gospel, we preach an incomplete gospel. We say you need to get saved and then go to heaven. We need to go back to the origin. When you were born in your mom's womb, let's go back there. God formed you in your mom's womb. Come on. He fashioned you. And he placed a purpose into your heart. If you miss the origin, you're going to think, why do I got to do this for because you don't understand your human design. God designed you and I to live for his purposes. Before you're a construction worker, you are a man of God. Before you are an office manager, you are a man of God. Before anything else, I am a child of God. At the end of the day, I have to stand before the Lord. Did I accomplish his purpose for my generation? That's the question. We accomplish God's purpose in our generation. Acts chapter 13, verse number 36 says this. It's going to go up on the screen, I believe. There it is. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body de decayed. Your purpose... It's to serve God in your generation before your time come. Before the silver cord has been cut. Our purpose, anything else is short of that. You are not born to work a 9 to 5 job, a 9 to 5 job, a 9 to 5 job, and then you die. That's what the devil will try to do to many people. Okay, that's what you want to do. Good. Go sit at that corner over there. Work your 9 to 5 job. You, us four, and no more. Die. Beat it. Excuse my language. Go ahead. Just go. Because you don't make a lick of difference. If God was to ever answer any of our prayers, would it change the world or would it only change us four and no more? God's heart is bigger. His family is big. His purposes is big. And his grace is enough to find us and include us into his purpose. Amen. Your purpose is not just to work and money. All those stuff are great. But not at the substitute of what you have been born and designed to do. You take a star out of the sky, it will die. You take a plant out of the ground, you will die. You take a fish out of the water, it will die. Take you away from God. Amen. And David said that. You know how you know David fulfilled God's purpose? Because he was a man of cause. He was a man that said, let me, I be the change. 1 Samuel 17, 29. David is a man after God's own heart. And he walked upon uh, his brothers. And, and you know the story. I'm not going to go through for the sake of time. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? The army was paralyzed because they had a giant in the midst of them and the promise of God. Maybe you have a tyrant in the middle of the street telling you, go ahead, buddy. You cross this street. I'm going to take you out. So some of us have been on this side of the street. We never dare to cross the street, although we want to cross the street. But Goliath has got us on this side. And the Lord is saying, today, let's go to the other side. Today, let's go to the other side. So David, he came up on the battle and everybody was there. 
Have you ever hung around in security or fear long enough that you just build them an, an extra bedroom in your heart? Have you ever hung around intimidation long enough that all of a sudden you, move, you, you, you let them move in? And you don't even charge them rent? That's how some people are the children of Israel sitting there. The enemy was coming right in front of the face. And he said, is there anyone amongst you who can come out here? Take it out with me. And you know, he was smart because he came in the evening right before the sun went down. And he came in the morning right before the sun came up. That's how the enemy works. The last thing he wants you to think before you go to bed, fear. The first thing he wants you to wake up to, fear. That's how he worked. The enemy is threatened by those who are not moved by him. Amen. And so he's going to come and he's going to stand in the front. And David came. David walked up on these guards and they said, man, they're ready for battle. Y'all ready for war? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you ready for war? Yeah, 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 yeah. He heard something. He heard the threat. And he started taking, giving out manapuas. Passing out some pork hash from the monopoly truck. <laughs> and he, he did one of his numbers. Anybody hear what I'm hearing? How many of us got desynthesized? You have been desynthesized. Because you let the attacks of the enemy, man, hit you so hard. The argument hit you so hard that you will tolerate your family not talking to each other for three months. You will allow the devil to mess with you for like six months. And you're okay with it. That's the problem. It's not the enemy. It's people become okay with it. They're okay with it. With, the, with Goliath. It took a man after God's heart. He came up. Is there not a cause? Guys, we're going to let this guy talk to us like that? And they will look at him like, who do you think you are? You know, there's a young generation who raised up. And they're going to be that generation that say, is there not a cause? Huh? They all said, this giant is too big to take down. I said, this giant is too big to miss. <laughs> we don't need no sissies in church. Amen. There's no crying in baseball or crying in football. Come on, we need men, women who's got a spiritual backbone. Not because of us, but because of him. So Goliath come, you say, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And then lo and behold, David did what David did because he believed in the God that he served. Because when nobody else was looking, he was playing his harp. He was writing psalms. When nobody else was looking, he was working at night. Third shift, overnight shift because he wasn't popular. When everybody else was doing their normal thing, he was just worshiping God. By the way, his name is mentioned more in the Bible than anybody else. Even more than Jesus, David. And he fulfilled God's purpose in his generation before he go to sleep. Can that be said of us? That we fulfilled God's purpose? Not, not, not partial. Fulfill God's eternal purpose for us. John 18, 37. The same person said what David said. And it was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They were ready to crucify him. They were ready to put him... They were ready to put him up, uh, upon a cross and he was being persecuted. And Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world. That I should bear witnesses to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Listen. He came to bear witness of the truth. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth don't set you free. It's the truth that you know. Ah, let me say that again. The truth don't set you free. It's the truth that we know. Stop falling for the lies. Stop falling for the lies. He's a deceiver. He will try to deceive you. He's going to try to keep you in your past. Go ahead. Go ahead and stay there in unforgiveness. He's a deceiver. Jesus already took the unforgiveness upon him when he hung on the cross. But he doesn't want you to know that. Jesus said, is there not a cause? Because like our Jesus, our cause is very specific. 
that is to be the change to our generation. Our cause is to be the change to the world that is hurting. You turn on the news, you watch CNN and NBC and all these channels and you see nothing but negative. By the way, all lives matter. In the kingdom of God, all lives matter. Amen. Jesus was born. He knew his purpose. He was born to die. Jesus' cause was to die a violent death on the cross to restore humanity to the Father. Jesus' cause was to take on sin's best shot. The judgment on sin, was he took it upon himself and he nailed it to the cross. That was his cause so that you and I could be reconciled back unto God. He fulfilled his part. You, me, need to fulfill our part. Amen? Three things real quick. Number one, Jesus' cause was to bring eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. Hebrews 9, 12 goes on to say this. It goes up on the screen. Just follow along with me. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. That means Jesus died for your past sins, your present sin, and your future sins. That's how powerful his blood is. Jesus' blood is powerful. Amen. First John 2, 2, he said, he himself is a propitiator for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the world. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of what? Sin. And this is eternal. The eternal God, whatever he does, it's eternal. Amen. His promises are eternal. The power of his blood is eternal. Come on, somebody. He translated us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Eternal redemption. Why are you acting like you're not saved? If that was to arrest Christians, would you have enough evidence to be arrested? Well, I go to work. I, you know, I do good. I don't. So that's what your, your co-workers do. That's what my unsaved friends do. They work a job and go home. What's the difference? I'm sorry. Get back on the track. <laughs> Everybody say eternal redemption. Yeah. Number two, his cause brought us eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9.15. Go ahead. It's going to go up on the screen there. Y'all good? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Listen, everybody look at me. He's the mediator in the new covenant. Jesus wasn't in the, in the, in the old covenant. That's why Moses did, stood between them and the people. He, they, Moses was the mediator. Everybody, the king was the mediator. And the, the prophet was the mediator. And now you're on this side of the cross. Jesus is your mediator. Yeah. Amen. Jesus, watch this. He is our mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under his first covenant. You can catch that on your own, on your, on your devotion. <laughs> watch this. That those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Say, I have an eternal inheritance. <laughs> what does that mean, Pastor Fika? That means the promises of God for your life is eternal. Uh, it doesn't have an expiration date. How's that? Catch this. That means the peace of God is eternal. Ooh, I ain't got no peace. Maybe you need to go back to the cross. You need to receive your peace. The enemy has been messing with your emotions. Oh, his finger came out. I got a couple more minutes. His promise is eternal. His peace is eternal. His prosperity is eternal. Come on. His Power is eternal. You see, 10 minutes ago, you were up here. Now that's in your past. Now you're back there. Now you're in the present. Guess what? God is in your past, your present, and two hours from now at the same time. His power <laughs> is not limited by time or season. 
His love is eternal. His name is eternal. Why? Because we have an inherent, uh, eternal inheritance. Listen, he's an eternal God stepped out of eternity into time and space. He was trapped in a human body. He died a criminal's death. Everything that comes out of an eternal God is eternal. His goodness is eternal. You could be here today and you're sinning. God don't love you any less. Your, God, your, your sin, let me tell you something. Your sin does not regulate God's love level. He don't like your sin. He loves you. Why? Because his love is eternal. It's already settled 2,000 years ago. Ah. <laughs> Last, lastly, what was number one? Eternal redemption. Number two, eternal inheritance. And then number three, eternal purpose. His cause, eternal redemption. Give us an eternal inheritance so that we could live an eternal purpose. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. This is his purpose. Go therefore and make disciples. Not Christians, not converts. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, of all neighborhoods in our city here in Honolulu and beyond. Baptize the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Guys, discipleship is about teaching. Preaching, you proclaim. Teaching, you explain. You cannot preach in your life group and expect them to grow. You got to teach them. Amen? That's scripture right there. Just look at it. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he came, eternal redemption, give us an eternal inheritance to give you and I an eternal purpose. A uh, friend here, her name is Helen Burhani. And Helen, she, she was, she's, she's from this place called uh, the state of Eritrea, from East Africa, the border of Sudan and Ethiopia. That's her picture right there. She's a worship singer. And what happened is because she worshiped the Lord, the persecuted church back then, uh, they, they, ha they had to renounce their faith, but she wouldn't renounce her faith. And so guess what they do? They locked her up into those containers right there, those shipping containers as a Christian. They locked her in there for two and a half years. No contact with the outside world, no legal representation, no medical care. And she was locked up in this medical camp. And in this metal shipping container for two and a half years, they always ask her, hey, are you ready to deny, to deny your faith, to deny Jesus? And she would always tell them, I would do anything except deny my Savior. As a matter of fact, let me just lend you into her story. Watch this, this couple minutes and then we're done. Thank you. It was so cold during the night. He would suffer hypothermia. So hot during the day that your skin would burn to the edge of the container. The bugs that bite you felt like fire all over your body. But like driving a nail into wood, every hit, every beating, every blow to my body drew me closer to God. These are some of the notes I took when I had a chance to spend a few days with a lady called Helen Bahani. What you don't understand or what you don't get when you first meet Helen is her past. You see, Helen spent two and a half years locked inside a metal shipping container for refusing to recant her faith. And not only that, she taught me one of the most profound spiritual lessons of my life. She taught me about thankfulness. If you were to wake up tomorrow with only the things you thank God for today, what would you have? In Helen's case, every day for two and a half years, she woke up on the floor of a jagged metal shipping container inside a prison where she was beaten and tortured regularly. But one of the most incredible stories for me is her response to a beating that very nearly took her life. You see, Helen had been writing notes of encouragement and sending them to fellow prisoners, putting scriptures on them that she could memorize. And the guards came to her and they said, Helen, where is your Bible? 
And she said, I don't have one. And they said, is it in your head? And she said, yeah, it's in my head. And they said, well, we're going to have to beat it out of you. They proceeded to grab Helen and, and, and they dragged her to a courtyard, placed her in the middle and started to beat her with wooden batons. What she does next has single-handedly changed my Christian walk forever. You see, in the middle of this beating, Helen stops and looks at the guy hitting her and says to him, I do not hate you. For you are just carrying out an order. But you need to know that I'm carrying out an order too. And that's not to renounce Jesus. So carry on. Carry on? I mean, when they were finished beating her, they simply threw her body back into the metal shipping container. And as she lay on the floor in the container, she began to sing the following. Thank you for the cold nights. Thank you for the hot days. Thank you for the hunger, for the sickness. Thank you for the bugs that bite my body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thankfulness. Have you ever stopped for a minute to think about what role it plays in your life? I mean, what role thankfulness plays in your everyday? If you're like me, it's probably not much. You see, I ask God for a lot. But in comparison, I thank Him for very little. The more I think about people like Helen Bahani and the persecuted church, the more it begins to dawn on me that it's actually reversed. You see, they thank God for almost everything. And in comparison, they ask Him for very little. And this is because they're not following an institution called Christianity. They're following a living God. We're following a living God who walked the earth and who today walks the earth through His Spirit. Our gratitude, our thankfulness, and the level by which we measure it should not be based off a set of rules or expectations and buzzwords, I guess, created by this Christian pop culture. It should be defined by Jesus Christ who walked with broken people, loved the unlovable, stood in the face of religion, led with a character and set of principles that he would not compromise for any one or any deal. Didn't seem to care about things like brand, fashion label, return on investment, number of friends on Facebook or followers on Instagram. And didn't mind looking awkward if saying no meant the right outcome was achieved. And on top of all that, loved a dying and broken world with a passion that could not be filled, stopped, watered down or contained. Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world, who ultimately laid down His life so that a sinful, broken and dislocated group of people could have eternal life with Him. And for that, I'm forever thankful. If you were to wake up tomorrow with only the things you thank God for today, what would you have? Please stand up on your feet. Thank you so much for your time. You know, I, I share this, um, even this message, because some of you know I, I, I'm one of Pastor R's 12, and, and I came from uh, West Oahu, and uh, I'm transferring here in Honolulu. And uh, God had raised up a great leadership there in uh, West Oahu under Joe and Stacy Pashan. And um, I had to really do a, a heart check. Because I had to build a brand new team. And I remember, you know, having my second meeting. You know, I, I had about 10 people who came. And I went home and my wife saw that something wasn't okay. So I just sat there and pouted in a garage. And she said, you okay? And she, I go, huh? She said, how'd it go tonight? And I said, oh, okay. How much people? I go, 10. She said, well, that's great. And I'm thinking, uh. 
You know, and I said this out of my mouth. I was joking, but I said, you know what? I think I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> what I was talking about was, referring to was me going after people. Make sure they, they're okay and are you coming to my meeting? I've, I've, I've been so accustomed to dealing with leadership and my leadership level that now I had to go back to ground zero. And then I had to rebuild that. And that's where these messages are coming from because I'm really searching in my heart. Son, why do you do what you do? Is it for title? And I, and I realize, and I've come to learn in my prayer that God's covenant with us is with our spirit, man, is the eternal part of us. That's where his covenant is at. But my emotions was trying to run my life. God's covenant with us is through our spirit. That's why some of us are up and down because our ministry is all about emotions. That's why some people are not here because they didn't feel like coming. His covenant with you and I is in our spirit. Ooh. And I had, we had an encounter with the Lord. Even this past prayer week, I was telling Mama, Pastor Kuna, how God will bring you back. And the center of it is that my spirit has received his righteousness. I can just rest. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to try to entertain and perform for it. That's why some of us get tired because we're trying, to, we're trying to move God. God said, everything I have, I released through my son. I've rented the heavens and I've released it to you. The enemy had blinded you. He's gotten you by your soul. You're under the sway. He's influencing you. So when you sin, you think, oh, I'm feeling bad. Jesus don't love me. God ain't mad at you. God ain't mad at nobody. His wrath was already absorbed at the cross of Calvary. You know what's getting you? Sin. And his power, condemnation, guilt. Don't let that stop the blood of Jesus from flowing. And so now, when I gather men, this last meeting I had, we had 21, 21 guys coming. Well, they're attenders, they're not disciples yet. Thank you for the shout. But you know one thing I noticed? Is that when we talk about discipleship, it's about purpose. Guys, you down? Lay it all for Jesus? Because everything in this world is going to pass, son. Daughter, everything in this world, don't put your, your hope in everything in this world. It's temporary. The job you're at is not guaranteed. They might call you one time, it's done. But the blood of Christ... That's why this past week we talked about that we must worship him. Must worship him. Spirit and truth. You must. That's the only way to worship it. Not from emotionalism. It's from spirit. And it has to be so true, God. Amen. Why don't you close your eyes, lift up your hands. Go ahead. It's time. Let's lift your hands. Let's come back to the... Close your eyes. The blood. Come on, lift it up. Lift up your hands. Let your spirit men rise up. There it is. There it is. the blood. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood, Lord. Come on, declare it. Come on, let your spirit, man, sing out.
God, we lift our hands before you today and we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, Lord God. Thank you for doing a holy work in our lives today, Lord God. Thank you for the blood. The blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Father, we thank you for this amazing time in your presence thus far on this vision weekend. A weekend, Father God, where you're embracing us again with your unconditional, unfailing love, with your grace and with your mercy. Thank you for what you did for us to secure eternal redemption, eternal inheritance for the clarity of our eternal purpose. God, seal what you've been speaking into our hearts today by your Holy Spirit. Seal it with the blood of Jesus over our hearts and minds today. Oh God, that we would go further with you, that we would yield ourselves to you, Lord God. So thankful that your blood has cleansed us and made us whole and truly has given us a great hope for our today and for our tomorrows. This vision weekend, Lord God, has been ordained by you. A time, Lord God, that you can speak to us and strengthen us and encourage us to take the limits off of you, God. Because where you wanna take us and what you wanna do in our lives is far greater than we've ever experienced thus far. Because you are such a good, awesome and faithful God. So thank you, Lord God, for strengthening us today to be who you need us to be. The change, God, that's needed starts with us. If I change, everything will change. Thank you, God, for meeting us here today, right where we're at and for doing such a holy work already in our hearts and minds and lives today that we will not leave this place the same as we did coming in. Thank you for strengthening every individual here, every man, woman, every marriage, every family, every business. We are your sons and daughters first and foremost. We belong to you, God.
It's a privilege to be called your own father. It's a privilege to be called your minister and your witness, Father. It's a privilege to have Jesus as our brother. And you, Father, as our friend. It's a privilege to have the Holy Spirit living in us and leading us in life and peace as our comforter and our strengthener. It's a privilege, Lord God. It's a privilege to stand in your presence where there's fullness of joy and your joy is our strength, Lord God. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. Father, for every person at the sound of my voice, touch every heart, touch every life. Embrace us, God. Assure us that we're not alone. Thank you for healing and breakthrough that's been poured out already today great healing has already been dispensed in our midst from the inside out from the inside out from the inside out from the inside out we thank you for your goodness we thank you for your mercy we thank you Lord God for your faithfulness in our lives we love you Lord God for all the surrendered men and women to the Most High God and to His plans and purposes. Lift up a shout of praise and thanksgiving in this place. Man, we've had a powerful time so far, so I've got great news. We're not done. We're just going to take an 18-hour break, and we're going to resume tomorrow morning, all services, all campuses. And I really want to encourage all of you to join us for our Sunday night service. We're going to be concluding this amazing uh, vision weekend Sunday night right here in our sanctuary. And we're also going to be praying for and laying hands on all of our leaders. So uh, we're really expecting a deposit of a greater anointing in all of our lives. How many know God is clarifying our blurred vision? Amen. We're running forward. We're making a difference. So uh, as you leave, just a few reminders. If you haven't yet registered for the G20, 12 Hawaii Conference. You can do that right outside in the courtyard as well as our devoted women's event. Our encounter registration is available outside as well. And if you want any of today's sessions or last night's sessions, you can pick that up in our bookstore. Uh, you can order them um, from our bookstore, excuse me. But thank you so much for joining us today, and we will see you tomorrow. Go in the peace and the blessing of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>